I was talking to these guys a minute ago, and this is the second time I've worn a tie. So <laughs> hopefully it won't be too distracting, and I need to get it straight as my wife is <laughs> looking at me. So uh, thank you for being with us though tonight. Um, let me pray real quick. Calm my nerves a little bit, and then we'll get going. Lord, I just pray for... Pray for you to use me as as your mouthpiece this week. I pray that you help me to be still and know that you are God. I'm not here by my choice. I'm not worthy of it. So I pray that you're with me. I pray that you're with us. Open up our hearts and minds to the understanding of your word and and looking out at this world and seeing your your disciples who reach out in love and grace and and truth. Bless this time with us. In your name we pray. Amen. So tonight um, we are in Psalm 119, uh, verse 104. It's a very long, long verse. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's found on page 962 in your, in your Bibles, um, and it says this, I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. This is the word of the Lord. So the ways of understanding and the effects. Someone once said, God is different to all. We all read the Bible Each time you read it, the meanings change, you change, your life and situations change. It's all your interpretation and no one else's. Look into your heart and mind and you will find the correct and true answer. Someone else said, we are made to excel and explore and discover and learn and challenge and grow and know ourselves and be real people with ourselves and each other. Don't worry about being saved. Just be saved if that's what you need and live good. What are the ways of understanding today? And what are the effects? As we look in the scripture tonight, I want us to examine those things and I want us to examine ourselves as well. And ask ourselves, where do we go to for our understanding? Who do we trust in for our understanding? And how does that look in our lives. We know that Psalm 119 is a very long chapter, and it's set forth to magnify the law. And it brings about the excellency and the usefulness of divine revelation, and it's spoken of by experience. You see words like God's law, his way, his testimonies, his commandments, precepts, his word, sayings, judgments, Righteousness, statutes, truth, faithfulness, those are all synonymous. And they, they, they focus on the greatness of God's word. Here in this passage of uh, verse 97 through 104, the psalmist settles on the sweetness of God's law and the effects it has on him. So what I want us to do tonight is I want us to look at three main points. How the world gets understanding today and some apparent results, how the true child of God gets understanding, and the result of that godly understanding in our lives. So number one, how the world gets understanding today and the results that we can see. Number two, how the true child of God gets understanding. And number three, the result of that godly understanding. So how does this world get understanding today? I'm going to go through... a, a. a lot of points that I was thinking about, but it's no way exhaustive, no way, um, and you can, I'm sure, think of a lot of situations. But these, I think these are important ones and ones that we should look look out at the world with. Um, so the first one is we get understanding by whatever feels good. It's all driven by emotion. Today you see that in so many areas of of society, it's so centered on selfishness and self-centered pleasure. 
We see things like if you're not happy, we need to find what makes us happy. And we need to go for that. And therefore, we get understanding through those situations. And some of the causes of this are superficial relationships like in marriage. If somebody's not happy, today's society, and just up and leave. No big deal. Uh, you see this in, in kind of an, an entitlement age where we deserve, we are entitled to what we think we deserve. So it's all about us, and this is how we understand things to be. Another cause is a disregard for responsibility. Um, I kind of feel like this is in more of the younger generation right now. It's all about the journey. And so say if a job is getting in the way, they're going to up and leave because they don't want that responsibility. It's getting in the way of their journey, so they want to go pursue those emotions and what feels good for them. And that's how they understand the world to be. Probably you've heard of the, the phrase YOLO. Um, I think Pastor Rob had had a, a sermon on that a while ago, I think. Um, but it, it, it means you only live once. And that whole thing is just about us. It's all about you, and it's all about what you want to do, and you only live once. There's nothing else, so just go do what you want to do and just live life to the fullest. And that's where you'll get understanding of the world, and that's where you'll get fulfillment. Uh, we see media doing this and targeting ourselves and targeting us as the important one. We reinvent ourselves through social media and, and other situations. And if people aren't receptive of who we are, then we switch ourselves, re re reinvent ourselves to make us different people, essentially. And that's how we get understanding. We're like chameleons. We just constantly change. We see many, many self-help books all over the place. Eight things to help yourself be a better person. Have your better life now, your best life now. And it's all about us. It's all about lifting us up. And that's how we get understanding. I was doing a little bit of research on this, and I came across um, Oprah Winfrey's website. And it was interesting because the title of this was How to Understand Your Importance in Life. And two of them kind of stood out to me, and they're, they're very interesting <laughs> So I'm going to read them, and it says, one of them says, join a religion. Many people find purpose by believing in a higher power. Religion is a great way to change your perspective, and even if you don't believe, you can always meet someone new. Another one says, you don't have to change the world. We don't live in a fly, fly or die society. There is plenty of room to sightsee and blaze a different trail. The most important person to be important to is yourself. We do this even in church. In, in, in emotional understanding, we get fueled by this emotional response, and we distort the view of God. We start making him into our own image. We start exalting man and his ability, and much of our spirituality today is focused on emotion and experience and not on truth. And so that's how we get understanding. We get understanding by these mystical responses and mystical uh, experiences, and it disregards the authority of Scripture. We see questions all over the place with, with regard to authority. People say, how dare you question me? How dare you question my understanding? I am myself, and I can find understanding no matter what. So who are you to question me? And this is where our human autonomy, our self-governing human freedom is lifted up, exalted higher than a, any portion of where it should be. You are the authority. You are Lord of your life, says the world. And this is the understanding from the world. You are the master of your own destiny. If you really try, you can accomplish anything you'd like to do. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you. I have an atheist friend who has a tattoo across her wrist that says, Make yourself. Us and what we want to do. 
We have notions and beliefs that we are born good. Just trust in yourself. Just look into your heart, and there you will find understanding. No regard to God, no regard to Scripture. We have a huge problem with authority today in our individualistic society. The words obedience and submission are bad words in a lot of our society. You are the highest standard, not God. You, man, are the highest standard, not God. And you, yourself, can have understanding. We get understanding in whatever seems good by our reason. Our reason, our human reason, is lifted up. And a lot of this is, you see this in the majority wins. We go with the crowd, whatever is the popular thought. We go with that, and that's how we understand the world. Uh, because who so-and-so said this, then we will agree. We don't really look into it to test it and try to find understanding where we should go. Um, in a class that I was taking, we were watching this video, and it was kind of an, an, a marketing thing, and it was talking about you know, uh, Apple, or one of the greatest, you know, biggest companies out there, and they they would first drive it on why they were producing a, a, an item. And so a lot of people would latch onto that, and it was like 15%. And then the 40% after that would be followers of those people. And then the 40 after that would be followers because everybody else was following. So this was just kind of a, a migratory thing that whatever was good, whatever was popular to the crowd, people would go for it. So this, this lifts up our reasoning of trying to understand with our minds and our reason of what, how this world is. And so our culture dictates our reasoning. Another thing is our culture dictates our theology. So you go deeper into to the church, and it's, I have a brain, therefore I can. I myself have the ability. So we define God through our cultural lenses, which is fueled by emotion, which is lifted up by our reason. We, know we, need, we have no need to know church history. It's irrelevant. Whatever is important is here and right now. We don't need to look back. We don't need that stuff. Man's opinion versus God's word, we see that everywhere today. And oftentimes, man's opinion wins out. And this is how we understand the world. Authority of Scripture, as I mentioned earlier, is greatly undermined, so we look to culture. We look to culture for the answers, to find reasoning. We're in a subjective relativism, relativistic world that says your interpretation is right. Truth to you is right, and no one should question that. It's all your perspective. Don't think, just allow. Just go with the flow. You have a reason. You have emotion. And that's how you get understanding. It's all experiential. There's no intellect. Theology is deemed unspiritual and unimportant. Your reason and your heart guide you, is what the world says. And it will guide you into all truth and understanding. Why? Because you have the authority. You are the one who can, who can do this, who can understand the world. A friend of mine, a poet and theologian, said this in one of his songs. He said, it, it would be easier to get along, but if everyone's view is true, then who is wrong? This is a world that we live in, and our understanding is based off of our culture, based off of what we want. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way to death. So with that, we look at the understanding of a true child of God. How do we get understanding? Here we find the psalmist saying, through your precepts, I get understanding. Through your precepts, what is that? We looked at the synonymous words of that. And it, for us, it's, it's compiled in the scripture now. It's God's word. And this is the external source for our understanding. Truth is outside of us and God's special revelation. 
truth is divine. It comes from God, not culture, not feeling, no reason. Truth is absolute. It's not a truth. Scripture is the truth. Truth is objective. It's not swayed by feelings that can fluctuate. It is exact and it is explicit. It never changes. Truth is immutable. So this truth is revealed to us by God. God, almighty God of all creation, has revealed himself to us. And he wants us to understand and to know his ways. He wants us to know his will, his teachings, his commandments, how to live life and how to get understanding. All-powerful, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present God himself has revealed himself to us. That is truly amazing to me. And he's revealed his his will to us in Scripture. And it is the standard for faith and godliness. And it's the standard for belief and and life. And it's laid out in his law. We've been talking about uh, Leviticus. and, And one of the reasons for the law is to show us our sin. To show us that we need a Savior. And to show us the redemption in our Savior. And it is also for our own good and for our freedom. And so you think about if you, if you have, say you have a bunch of property way out in the middle of nowhere on the, on the edge of wilderness. And you have, an an, you have a pet. You have a dog. You, have, you want this big area for him to just go and play and you get a bunch of toys and you get a bunch of apparatuses and whatever. And you just have this whole area for him to play. Now what if you didn't put a fence around it? He's an animal. He's wanting to just take off and go and explore. And as soon as he goes into the wilderness, you know what could happen. So will you, put a, you put a fence around it. You want him to be protected. You want boundaries around him so he can truly have freedom and so he can truly have protection. And this is what God does for us, setting out his law and his truth in Scripture for us to be guided and for us to have freedom and understanding of this world. And through this understanding, we we need to know who we are as well. John Calvin once said, knowing God begins with knowing yourself. In In order to know who God is, we need to know who we are. And in order to know who we are, We need to know who God is. We need to know what happened at the fall of Adam. And we need to know what extent did the fall affect humanity. We need to know who we are as natural people and our ability or lack thereof. We are created beings governed by a personal God who has revealed himself to us in Scripture for our understanding. And he has given us his law, but no one understands. We are not able to understand the things of God apart from the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is the internal source to get understanding. He's the one who gives us understanding of God's truth. And there are two parts to this. The first is regeneration. We know that this is the rebirth the being born again, the the glorious work of the Holy Spirit in us, where he gives us a brand new heart, and he takes the heart of stone out of us. He gives us a responsive heart that can love God, that can understand his ways. And so he brings us to life. He gives us a new nature so we have new desires, so we can love him. And by that regeneration, now that our eyes are open, our minds are open, and our hearts are open to the things of God, he teaches us. He teaches us and gives us this understanding. So we have this desire to pursue him, and now he teaches us. He reveals himself to us in his his truth, and it changes us, it transforms us, it renews our minds so we know his will, and we know that we have understanding in this broken and fallen world. 
He is the truth teacher. The spirit of truth has been given to us as the truth teacher, and that is one of his jobs. And that is truly amazing because I stand before you. If you saw me four years ago, you would think completely different. It's unbelievable, and, and it's all the spirit of God revealing himself to me. And that's his job. He reveals himself to us, gives us understanding in the degrees of our lives. It's different for everybody else. And so we lean not on our own understanding. And in all our ways, we acknowledge him. And he will make our path straight. And so why is this better than the world's understanding? Why is God's truth and his understanding better than the world's? Because he is God and we are not. We are created beings governed and watched over by a sovereign God who who journey who takes us on a journey who has set forth a plan for our life and set us in history for a purpose and for a reason it's the almighty god and it's the wisdom of the almighty god that is the understanding that we can go out into this world and we can have confidence and we can make decisions in our own life, trusting and knowing that we have a purpose and that we have an understanding that because a sovereign and mighty God has given us that understanding that we could not have before. We've been brought to life, and now we have a new life. So what is this result of this godly understanding? Well, the first part I want to talk about is an appetite. It's the new appetite of a new creation. And it's the hunger for spiritual food. Because we have a new nature, because we have been changed, we have new desires. And one of the desires in this context that we see in Scripture tonight is a desire to look and to understand and to know truth from false, to discern what is true and what is false. It is desire that only the Holy Spirit brings to us. Why? Because now we know what the root of the falsehood is. The enemy in self. And so the Holy Spirit drives us to want to know truth. To want to have understanding. Because now we see what the world is. What it really is. We know that looking into our hearts is death. We know that trusting in ourselves is death. And that's very tough for us. It's very tough to walk in a world like ours, being able to do that. But now we have a sensitivity, sensitivity to our sin as well. Because we have a heart and an eyes that can see our sin for what it really is. And so we don't want any part of that sin that separates us from the God who made us new, who has given us life. And so we want to understand and study Scripture to guard against the false ways, to guard against what this world says is okay and what this world says our understanding should be. We don't want to mistake the conduct of our own life as well. We, we have a desire to, to watch our life. And we also have a desire to be able to advise others as well. And so it's a, it's a discernment and an understanding and a sensitivity to watch what we're doing because we are attuned to the things of God now and we have a desire to understand and know Scripture. And through this, it forms our worldview. It forms how we look at the world, the lenses that we look at this world, how we perceive it, what is important, what are our values. And this should affect all of every area of our life. And this is evidence of a true faith. One evidence is a hatred for the false way because we know what it is now. Which brings us to a hatred of the false way in this text. So you get this implied implication to a desire to understand and to know truth from false. And now we see a hatred, a result of that desire to know. There's a hatred for the false way, the false path. It's a deliberate rejection. 
And this is very tough. You see David wrestle with this a lot. But it's knowing what this falsehood is. And so this is in me, and it's in the world. We hate the false way in us. We are sensitive to our sin. We hate this false way in the world because we know all is vanity without Jesus. All is empty without Jesus now. We hate the false way in what opposes truth. Martin Luther stood in the Diet of Worms, and he could do no other. He was captivated by the Word of God. He discerned truth from false, and, and he was captivated. He couldn't do anything else. And so you see this culminating in an appetite for the Word, with a capital W, for Jesus. For Jesus himself and for his words of eternal life. They're precious to us. His words are precious, and they change our thinking. His salvation comes the way... His salvation changes the way we see people. Every day I walk by people. And I walk by souls who are going to end up in one place or another. Biblical truth is utterly important for us because we know what's at stake. And so we have this appetite to know Jesus and to know his words of eternal life. We look to who he is and what he did. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way. His death is the only way to eternal bliss. He's the perfect sacrifice. He's the appeasement of God's wrath. And by his own blood, he entered in the most holy place, securing the salvation of those that the Father gave him. He is the perfect Savior who saved perfectly. And so in him, God and man meet. Through him, God and man meet. And by him, God and man meet. Justice and love collide at the cross in such an amazing picture of history. He is the truth. His words and his gospel are only, the only truth to believe. It's the plan of God's redemption. He speaks truth and he is truth. In him we find truth, and through him we get understanding. He is the life. His resurrection, through that, is the only life that can be given to us. We are given his life. We are holy because he is holy. We are righteous because he is righteous. He is our perfection. And we don't look beyond that. He is divine wisdom and the incarnate Son of God that is our eternal life. He is our eternal life. And knowing Him is eternal life. He's the beginning, the middle, and the end. The Alpha and Omega of our salvation. And in Him we find ultimate satisfaction. Because He is the one who saved us. By His blood we are alive. So he is our only satisfaction. I often ask people this. If you had him and only him, would you be completely satisfied? That's a hard question to answer. He is our our satisfaction. He is the love of our life. We are saved by his grace alone, through faith alone, in him alone. That is just amazing because it all culminates down to him, the glorious son of God. And when this morning when we were singing a song, it, it, it just kind of struck me of a place that we can go to. And the words said this, once again I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy. And I'm broken inside. Once again, I thank you, and once again, I pour out my life. That is our focus. It's in him. So we look to the cross and what he did for us. 